Clark Technic introduced his DN300 series of graphic equalizer in 1982, making it nearly 40 years old. Now in any industry, if the company was still even around making audio gear, that would be pretty impressive. But the fact that you can go online right now in 2019 and buy the DN370, the same series of graphic equalizer, a two channel version with some modern upgrades and features is almost unbelievable. It sounds like a dramatization, but how many other product series have been around with that kind of longevity at the top of the game? And furthermore, they haven't just frozen this one in time, they've continued to develop it and add modern features as the series has developed over the years. With the exception of the DN370 from Clark and a few offerings from Ashley, mainstream availability of high-end analog graphic equalizers just isn't what it used to be, and that's obviously due to demand. I think it's really fun though to jump back in time to when analog gear like this was a bit more common. Now I've never been hugely into the boutique gear and uh, stuff that's meant to color your sound, mostly due to budget. And I never really connected with the idea of vintage gear that takes a ton of work to keep going, a bunch of maintenance or specialty uh, parts and things like that. I think maybe owning a Delta Lab Effectron delay uh, that never did the same thing twice kind of got a lot of that out of my system at a young age. I really like gear that was designed to be incredible incredibly predictable, to be reliable, repeatable, to me, that's the cool stuff. I remember buying a Clark DN716 delay back in the early 2000s on eBay that had spent its entire life installed at the Mile High Stadium in Colorado. I enjoy thinking about all of the announcements at events and games and things like that that made their way through the miles of copper in a stadium to racks that were hidden away and forgotten about where a piece of gear like a DN716 could be left on indefinitely, but expected to produce those same quality results at any moment when it was called on. In the era before cell phones and public Wi-Fi and constant connectivity, public address systems in arenas like that were the only way to get a message across to a large gathered crowd. And when you pop open a DN300 now, you can tell that the engineers working on these things were taking their job seriously. Now, as more of this stuff rightly ends up being recycled for its reusable materials, I hope to keep finding examples like this one that have led a pretty good life and just need a little care to put them right. So we can preserve a few here uh, to show off as examples for engineers that might come along and never see something like this in their work going forward. Now this DN300 is a 30 band EQ with 12 dB of cut or boost available per band in the usual one third octave steps between 25 and 20,000 Hertz. Now this is the same configuration that Clark still uses on their DN370, even though most other manufacturers go with a 31 band design, adding that bottom 20 Hertz below what we have here. We do get low and high pass filters and provided our 12 dB per octave second order Butterworth filters with the high cut being switchable to 6 dB per octave if you should want to do that. The high pass or low cut covers from 15 Hertz up to 300 on these older models, the newer one going from 20 to 500, uh, with the low pass or high cut going from 2.5K, extending all the way up to 30,000 on this one. The DN370 moves that down to starting at 2000 and only going up to 20. Now these units here being from the early 80s have input and output topologies that can trip up even the most seasoned technicians then and now. So let's take a closer look. Now, while the IO looks fairly standard and what you'd expect on a unit like this, we have to remember at the time the lack of standards for things like connecting an XLR up to a line level piece of equipment. Those standards wouldn't come around for almost another eight years after this unit was first introduced. So buyer beware if you're buying gear pre say 1990, you need to take a look at what's going on inside and we'll get to that in a moment. The input here is fairly predictable. It's an electronically balanced design and you could order this unit from the factory with an input isolation transformer. The output however on these are unbalanced and you could order a balanced output transformer to add to this. The input had to be ordered at the time you place the order for the original unit, but the output transformer was an optional add-on you could add later. Now the real kicker with these is they are pin three hot. So, so far we have a balanced input pin three hot and an unbalanced output pin three hot. 
Now that's a whole other topic and could be multiple videos explained by people who are actually involved. And the best I can do right now with that is to link below a forum discussion. It's probably the best explanation online that you'll get in a few minutes of reading or, or studying as to what went on with these standards at towards the end of the 80s. And there's a forum discussion with some engineers from manufacturers at the time who were working in the field who talk about exactly what went on and how much of a challenge it really was, not just to adopt the standard, obviously they chose pin two, that's what they went with, but within manufacturers, when you had current production equipment being sold out the door with pin three, then all of a sudden you introduce this new standard of pin two and dealing with your former clients and future clients and current installations and uh, different product lines that are in different stages of development. I can only imagine the headache that it was, but thankfully they did it and we have pin two as a standard now. So that's linked below, check it out. It's really interesting, but that's the buyer beware part. If you're buying anything, pre-1990 say, just to be on the safe side, it's worth checking to see if it's pin two hot, pin three hot, if somebody converted it, if the person that converted it did it right, there's all sorts of issues people have caused thinking they needed to convert them and then making more trouble. So buyer beware. This one is in fairly good shape. The front panel has been bent, possibly just by these spacers being put back in the wrong place. It's also missing a few screws on the front panel, so we're gonna have to see about sourcing a few of those. But it'll be coming all the way apart to fix the uh, bending issue here and rework those spacers. So it'll get a good cleaning then. It'll get fully tested at that point here in the next little bit. And then somebody also drew on it with a pen to uh, mark like a preset. So not really sure what I'm gonna do with that. I don't wanna go scrubbing at it, but hopefully that'll come off pretty quickly. So once I get a chance to pull it apart, give it a proper cleaning and test and make sure everything's working, we'll address things like that pin three uh, hot issue and see what we're gonna do. If anybody has a line on one of the output transformers for this, I'd love to add that. They had some optional uh, per specs and they also had a metal one, I believe, uh, covers for these, like a security cover. It'd be cool to show those off as well. I'm not sure if any of those still exist out there, but if anybody knows of them, uh, drop me a message. I'd love to talk to you. So in doing all of that, it's worth mentioning that even with the above average documentation that a company like Clark is known for these days, the service manuals for these products back then were really something special. Forget a block diagram, they give you step-by-step -step written descriptions of the circuits, including reference numbers to the schematic they've provided. And by the end of reading this manual, you feel like the engineer who wrote it is a little disappointed in you for not having knocked one up on your own as you followed along. And maybe that was a little bit of the magic of companies like Clark back then. That confidence to print the schematic, that tacit challenge to anybody who wanted to know more about what they were doing to pick it up and just read it. I think we could use a little bit more of that and it starts in places like the manual. That's where we find out what a company is really all about, what a product is all about, and if there are any hard numbers provided or if it's just more marketing speak. In today's world, we're kind of forced to look at these things through the lens of intellectual property and people reverse engineering your products for profit. I'll leave it there. That's all for this time with the DN300. If anybody does have a line on those output transformers or the covers, drop me a message below. I've linked everything that I've talked about in the video down below. All of the, uh, the forum posts and the information about this, the manual, everything's down there. Check it out or jump over to dcsoundop.com. Every video I do gets a page posted over there with all the links, much easier to keep the links uh, up to date over there as opposed to all the YouTube description. So thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out with me with this DN300 from almost 40 years ago. I really can't wait to get this one working and to use it in some future videos and share it with everyone. So that's it for now. I'll see you next time.